So it is uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. He is an associate professor of computer science at uh, Rice and has done a lot of work recently in the area of electronic voting. Uh, in a prior life, he was a grad student at Princeton who worked with Ed Felton and uh, has interesting stories about receiving uh, nasty grams from RIAA lawyers about breaking watermarking and pointing out obvious things of the such. But uh, today, his talk is going to be about his adventures in e-voting research. Thanks, Justin. Let's see. Uh, is my audio working? Everybody hear me? OK, fair enough. So I titled this talk Adventures in Electronic Voting Research, both as a shameless way to try to attract people with making the talk more interesting than it actually is, and because this sort of work does occasionally involve more adventure than the average computer scientist tends to experience. So the work I'm going to be describing is joint work with one of my graduate students, Dan Sandler. Dan Sandler is also the wizard of Apple Keynote. So if the presentation looks beautiful and great, then that's my student. And if it looks weird and messed up, that's me converting it to PDF and getting it wrong somehow. OK, taking it away. This story begins with what Dan and I did over spring break in March of 2006. So the beginning of our adventure is in Webb County, Texas. This is in Laredo, which is a bustling border town. NAFTA has been very, very good to Laredo. And so the city of Laredo, Laredo's population may be a quarter million, with another million across the river in Nueva Laredo. And our story begins with the March 2006 primary election. Now, some of you might think that Texas is full of a bunch of Republican types. I don't know where you might get that impression. But in fact, South Texas is actually a Democratic stronghold, such that the Democratic primary election in Laredo is the election, for all intents and purposes. Which means that even though it says primary election, you should read this as the election. And this is their very first time that the county of Webb County, Texas, used electronic voting systems. OK, that's the setup. Everybody ready? So here's the, the, and the, the voters were given an unusual choice as they were transitioning to using these shiny new computers. They could vote on a touchscreen electronic voting machine, very shiny, very happy, colorful, or they could take a pen and apply it to these processed dead trees that we call paper and fill in a little bubble which would be counted centrally with an optical scanning system. So let me tell you about a judicial race. In Texas, judges are elected. And this is a race between um, uh, an incumbent judge, Manuel Flores, and his challenger, I forget his first name, Lopez. And what happened? There were about 50,000 votes cast in this particular race. The margin of victory was very small, two-tenths of a percent. And the loser, who happened to have been the incumbent, suspected that something was wrong with the DREs because he won on the paper and he lost on the DRE. Therefore, clearly something is wrong. Yeah, DRE stands for direct recording electronic, by the way. Sorry. I try to avoid using acronyms, but that one's inescapable. So what do you do when you lose by a tiny margin and you suspect the technology is at fault? Any guesses? Sue, which is exactly what happened. So when you, when you have a lawsuit that involves a technical question, you need to go and find yourself an expert who can be impartial. And so, that, so I, my phone rang. And you know, Dr. Wallach, this is so-and-so lawyer from, you know, can you please come down? We'd like to have you work on this. So my student Dan and I flew down in April to go have a look at what we could figure out. So there were two kinds of data that we could collect. These voting machines have compact flashcards, just exactly like the ones in your digital cameras. And we were able to get some of them, and they had this binary, undocumented, opaque, bizarre file format, which later on a smart undergrad of mine cracked and figured out you know, what it was. You know, just n nothing crypto, just you know, binary and obfuscated. There were also 
text records that you know, the lawyers gave me a shiny CD and said, this is what the election administrator gave us. See what you can do. There were two classes of records, all text easily readable with your favorite editor. One was called an image log. This, so images, these are like cast ballots. Here is a ballot, and here are who the votes were for. And they were allegedly in a random, randomized order. Then the other thing was what's called an event log. So this is everything other than who the people voted for. At a certain time, this machine was enabled, etc. I'm going to talk about event logs a lot. So let's see. Did we find a smoking gun? Did we find evidence of evil DREs hacking the election? Did we find hacks? How could we? We had no time. We had no access. We had lawyers breathing down our neck from both sides. That was, this isn't a story about discovering evil, brilliant hackers on the Mexican border. This is a story about finding procedural problems in real voting systems. We found, so these event logs, which I'm going to talk about for the next couple minutes, are per machine records. For each machine, you get a list of events time stamped for when they occurred. These are things like, you know, we opened up the terminal, a vote happened at this time, we closed the terminal, etc. So this is a, a direct quote. So let me break this down for you. The uh, left column, this is a serial number of the voting machine. The next column is the uh, a PEB, that stands for Personal Electronic Ballot. It's basically a battery-powered smart card box thing that talks via infrared to the voting machine. If you think in your head, smart card, then you're right along. You know, this is the thing that's used to enable the voting machine to take a vote. Those, those have serial numbers, too. There's a date at which the event occurred, a date and time, and then an event code. So we had, page, we had you know, pages and pages of this stuff. So we started flipping through it by hand, and whenever we'd identify something funky, we'd write a bunch of Python to try to find every place where that same funkiness occurred. So here's an example of something funky. Anybody see something wrong with that? So you might notice that this says that the machine was cleared on 3.30 PM on the day of the election. Right? Polls opened at 7 a.m. What happened between 7 a.m. and 3.30 p.m.? Answer, we have absolutely no idea, because there are no records. So perhaps some votes were lost. There were approximately 10 machines that had some variation on this theme, where the machine was cleared at some point on election day. That just shouldn't be. Likewise, check out this date. Does that strike anybody as funky? I'll remind you, the election was on the 7th of March. And here it is March 6, and we have a bunch of votes cast. That might strike some of you as possibly problematic or indicative of, of errors or fraud or heaven only knows. A total of 41 votes were cast on the wrong day, according to these timestamps. So here's a case, a more specific case, where we, see, we saw several machines where the votes were cast the day before the election. There were precisely two votes. And when we went to the actual vote records for the machines, the order was randomized, but we could see the machines that they came from. And Every single one of the votes of this sort, there would be one Republican primary vote and one Democrat primary vote. And the Democrat was, vote, both of them were for precisely the same Republican or Democratic slate. So there's a word for that. They're called logic and accuracy tests. And these logic and accuracy tests were included in the final election tally. So right there, I can just tell you that a quarter of the winner's margin of victory was an error. I mean, just right off the top. So after our first investigation, you know, we had, 
we, we, had all, we had a bunch of machine serial numbers that we wanted to go and touch in person. And by now, the lawyers had finished arguing with each other and calling each other bad names and had agreed that the experts would be allowed to inspect some of these machines in person. So when you're a professor and you need to do something ugly, what do you do? You send in your graduate student. <laughs> so they ha th this is the outside of their warehouse. The warehouse space is a little bit smaller than the room that we're sitting in now. And the machines were all piled in at this kind of a density. That's about half the machines. So they had to lug them outside. The serial numbers are printed in six-point type inside the thing, and they were in no particular order. So the computer scientists in the crowd might say, that's like an order and process. Yes. <laughs> you have to open up the booth and open up the thing just to read the little serial number to figure out that this is a machine you didn't care about. Repeat. And oh, by the way, they set a record high temperature on the day that, that my poor student was actually lugging all these damn machines around. So this is computer science field research. <laughs> so for the machines that we suspected were logic and accuracy tests, the clocks were accurate. So the machine, at least you know, when you boot them up, the time that they reported was, was today. It was now. So from that, we concluded that these were, in fact, cast the day before the election, and therefore they were test votes, and therefore we could subtract them from the tally. OK, poof, one quarter of the margin of victory disappears. For all the other machines that we could find, we found probably you know, 60 70% of the machines on our hit list. And at that point, he just said, enough, I'm done. <laughs> um, the clocks were incorrect, so they were like off by a day in one case, off by a year. So, and that actually accounted for all of the anomalies we were able to find by reading the logs. Now, you should realize this is far from proving that the tally was correct. It merely proves that we could find reasonable explanations for the anomalies that we found. Does this make you confident in the outcome of the election? I, you know, so the real problem is that we just had insufficient audit data. Many of the machines were cleared on the day after the election, or you know, shortly after the election, in direct violation of a judge's order. Many of the paper tapes that are supposed to be printed out as proof that the machines have been zeroed were missing. Many of the records that we might want to see to corroborate what we had were missing or gone. This, in particular, there's a, a feature where you can cancel a ballot. What does it mean to cancel a ballot? There's this problem called the fleeing voter, which is really, these are voters who didn't figure out to hit the button that says, I'm done. <laughs> this is analogous to leaving your ATM card in the ATM machine because you got your money. Right? The, the analogous voting thing is you picked your candidates and you forgot to hit the I'm done button. <coughs> So there's a whole procedure they can go through to cancel the ballot. Now, you might say to yourself, well, shouldn't you cast the partial ballot rather than throwing away the partial ballot? That's a legal question, not, not my department. In Texas, the answer is you throw the ballot away because your vote counts. Um, anyway, let's stand back and try to reach some conclusion or observations or something. Mistakes were made. I hope I'm not exaggerating the point to claim that, in fact, this was not the best administered election the world has ever seen. Just basic election procedures were simply done wrong. The, the, you know, I can run off a list of 20 different things that they should have done, and the manual said they should have done, and the poll workers were probably even trained to do, that didn't happen properly. And that caused a loss of records, and that made it hard to figure out what actually happened clock set wrong, et cetera. And at the end of the day, that impacts election confidence in the result. Why should you believe that the result that the election officials tell you is correct, given how much stuff went wrong? It's a legitimate question. OK, honest mistakes or illegitimate manipulation, right? There's no way to differentiate between them when, there's, when the records suck. It's difficult to audit an election in a case like this. 
here's a URL where you can read my expert report for the court. Please don't ra type this down rapidly. If you go to your favorite search engine and type the name Dan Wallach, which is conveniently printed on my badge, this, you can find this link from my homepage. Okay, now I'm going to use this example to try to motivate some research. Okay, we have identified a problem. Can we, as smart computer scientists who like to engineer shiny toys, can we build a better mousetrap? So we want to make it easier to audit the election after the election is over, and we want to make it harder to make mistakes. Can we engineer the system to make it harder to screw up? These are two valid research and engineering goals. We'd like to prove that every vote that was tallied at the end of the day belongs there, as opposed to those logic and accuracy testing votes. We'd like to prove the dual of this, which is every vote that was legitimately cast was included in the final tally. There should be a nice one-to-one -one mapping. That would be a good thing. Can we prove that? And we'd like to be able to tolerate accidental or malicious loss of data. We'd like to be able to tolerate machines failing. And machines will fail for a variety of reasons <laughs> during an election, and we'd like to be able to tolerate these kinds of failures. I'm not making this up. This happens. This is the world of elections. Is she making the did it? I believe that this woman is a poll worker who is expressing disdain at somebody's opinion about the quality of Diebold's engineering prowess, perhaps. Voters are wacky. What can I say? So how are we going to do it? You know, what you know, reaching into our bag of computer science tricks, you know, what can we pull out and leverage to help address this problem? So our answer is network them together. Let's try to, anybody here heard of this you know, networking thing? It's like a series of tubes. We're not gonna use the internet. I just wanna connect the voting machines together and be able to let them replicate records. I think Google might have some experience with replication as a fault tolerance mechanism. Am I preaching to the choir here? Oh, we can't tell you that, that's trade secret. Um, our goal is to waste resources like mad. When you think about the voting world, it's exactly upside down of the problem that you guys solve every day. You guys, as I understand it, every byte matters. Right? If you add one extra byte that you transmit to 10 bazillion users, that has a measurable impact on revenue. I find that staggering. <laughs> That's not the problem here. These voting machines are basically computers. They have huge amounts of memory, they could have hard drives if we want, and we're talking about capturing order of 1,000 votes in a day. The, event, you know, the number of events per second is a fraction, it's less than one. So we can waste resources. We can use algorithms that are super linear in the number of events. N squared, that's just fine. We've got, we've got time to burn, we've got space to burn, we've got bandwidth to burn. It's a very liberating feeling, isn't it? How often do you get to actually waste resources on purpose and feel good about it? Oh, it's great. So here's, so here's, so what, what can we do? We want to store everything everywhere. Every vote record on every single voting machine in the precinct. And we'd like to try to throw some crypto at the problem to create what we're going to call a secure timeline that can help us detect any tampering that might occur during the day. So how does that work? We're going to call this thing auditorium for reasons I will explain in just a minute. And the first ingredient we're going to use is a classic technique called hash chaining. The idea is, Every time you post an event to the log, you include the hash of the previous event. Thus, there's some recursive hashing going on. What this means is, if somebody wants to go back and change history, then your subsequent records will have hashes that are inconsistent with the past. This is a fairly simple but powerful technique that's easy to verify. And if you want to change history, now you have to change the future to be consistent with your false past. So that, that raises the barrier to entry. 
The next technique we're going to use, which is also a, a slightly more modern but still classic technique, this was invented by Mary Baker and Petros Maniatis while they were both at Stanford, is something called timeline entanglement. And you, know, you have these logs on individual machines. Now, whenever one machine sends a message to another one, it just includes the hash from the head of the log. And that hash gets included in the, uh, in the receiver's log. So now one machine's log effectively has a pointer to another machine's log, which, meaning, which means that even if you can corrupt and take over one machine, there are pointers to its prior history in other machines, thus making it even harder for you to consistently tamper with history. So conceptually, here's a diagram. Time is moving to the right, and we have pointers back to the left. Effectively, what you have is a DAG, where all of these hashes are pointers backward in time, which means that events on a single machine are totally ordered. Events across machines are partially ordered. Okay? For any two events, we can ask, are they, you know, we can conclude that they, that they have a common ancestor or a common descendant or have a direct, you know, this one came before or after that one. Or we conclude that there's simply no path in any way from one to the other. That would be interesting. All right, so let's waste resources. Let's broadcast every message to every machine. So you know, in our implementation, which I'm not going to talk too much about, we just use a simple n squared gossip protocol. Have you seen this yet? Oh, here you go. I mean, really gratuitously wasting network resources, but we don't care, right? Liberated. It's a great thing. So in practice, you know, the logical picture on the left has the physical picture on the right, where this, this real message A1 is sent to hosts B and C. Every, so every host actually has every single message. And we have a little bit of logic to deal with what happens if two things get sent contemporaneously, you know, ships passing in the night. So you figure it out, and you, you merge it back together again. Not really a, a big deal. So you have broadcast messages and timeline entanglement. That is what we call the auditorium. It's like auditorium. Get it? Hey, computer scientist, bad puns, wordplay, it all. Anyway, OK. So everyone hears everything in the auditorium. One mas machine announces a vote. All the other machines have copies. Now, some of you might be asking, now, wait a minute. What happens if I can jack into the network and I can see plain text votes? Yes, we have to do some kind of encryption. Hold that thought. We're getting there. This actually is some, there's some historical precedent for this voting architecture. So the conclave, which elects the new pope after the previous pope moves on to whatever comes next, um, the conclave is actually not unlike this. There's a whole procedure where the cardinals, you know, when they're doing their, in their college of cardinals, when they're all doing their thing, you know, the, the vote casting process, all of them can see it. And they have a whole procedure involving, they put their little written vote folded up in an envelope on a silver tray, and then on, everyone sees the silver tray get dumped into the silver bucket. And it, the process is visible to everybody, but yet the votes are secret. So yeah, um, try citing historical precedent like that in a research paper. Anyway, um, so, the so our architecture has a supervisor console that can see everything that's going on. The supervisor console, so here's where we want to help prevent, remember I said we want to help prevent mistakes? So here's like basic engineering 101. Wouldn't it be nice if the supervisor console could tell the poll worker, hey, machine number three's battery is running out. Could you go plug it in, please? Or the voter at machine number four hit the help button. Please go help them. This gets us an architecture not unlike when you go to Fry's to check out, and there's somebody telling you, oh, go down to counter number 24. And you, know, you, can, you can use technology to help orchestrate and make things smooth, which requires less training for the poll workers, et cetera. Now, at least in the common case where things are working like they're supposed to, the poll worker does what the machine tells them to do. OK. And again, ballots are distributed everywhere. And you can add a machine midday. If a machine blows up midday, not a big deal. We even have a hot spare for the supervisor. So the booths, now one of the things we have to worry about is imagine a booth goes crazy and starts announcing fake votes. 
how do we tell the fake votes from the real votes, right? So, okay, basic crypto architecture, every vote has to be authorized. The authorization includes a nonce, just a randomly chosen number. So any vote you see that doesn't have a corresponding authorization message must be bogus. So now in order for you to forge votes, you have to have an evil controller and an evil voting machine working in cahoots with each other. That increases the difficulty. It doesn't solve the problem, but it makes it harder. And yes, we're encrypting the votes, and I'll tell you how later. That's, the encryption gets a little bit tricky. The supervisor can monitor everything and can broadcast authorizations. And again, rec every, everybody records everything. We can have a backup. All right, well, now I've given you the pretty marketing pitch. Let's talk about how, how it fails, right? I'm a security guy, which means I spend my life analyzing how things break. So let's talk about different, let's start with the simple failures and then build up to the big catastrophic stuff. What happens if a machine fails? Well, again, I've, I've hit on this replication thing about 30 times, so the replication will, pr will protect us from regular failures. And we can prove that a vote record on, an, on a backup machine is legitimate by virtue of the fact that it has a corresponding authorization message. Every message is digitally signed, you know, off the shelf, boring, you know, RSA type digital signatures, so no magic there. What if a late machine shows up? You know, we have a, log, a longer queue of voters than we expected. Somebody calls to Election Central and says, we need more voting machines. Well, no problem. Plug them in and everybody can tell whether those machines show up empty or if they show up with votes on them, you know they're bogus because they're not connected to the timeline. Okay, ballots cast on the wrong day. Well, if the clocks are wrong, it's not a problem because we don't care so much about the, about the timestamps because we have the timeline. Either they're hooked into the timeline with the rest of the votes or they're not. So the timeline is more powerful than the timestamps. Likewise, we could easily distinguish test votes from real votes because the test votes are completely disconnected from the real election. And you can imagine that your auditing or tabulation infrastructure can look for that. All right, stuffed ballots. This would be sort of the first thing. If a machine starts generating bogus votes, you can distinguish them from real votes because they don't have the corresponding authorizations. If, if a ballot goes missing, you can detect it because the hash chain will be broken. Okay, so our basic architecture here is already capturing a lot of common fraud or error conditions. So what about bigger stuff? Okay. Godzilla is going to come and mess with our election. Well, one attack might be that a, a group of evil poll workers who have been running Precinct 342 for the last 20 years, and they've been deciding the results of their precinct for all of those years, and they're not going to let these newfangled voting machines get in the way of them deciding who wins the election. So what they might do is the day prior to the election, when, they have a, you know, when the machines were locked in the school cafeteria or wherever they are, they might sneak in and run a fake election, collect all the results, and then erase the machines, run a real election, and then try to swap the fake results for the real results. So let's call that a shadow election. You could imagine that they might also do that post facto rather than prior to the election. How are we going to deal with that? Well, we can have, let's, let's just call it a launch code. So the election administrator who might be concerned about some of their malicious poll workers on the morning of the election announces a code, you know, six digit pin, something like that. And if that pin doesn't appear in the log, then you, you know, if, if, if the votes are not successors of the pin, then that means that the votes aren't legit. So that would prevent somebody from staging a fake election prior to the real election. Post facto, you would let, the way to solve the post facto problem is you'd better make sure that these poll, the poll closed message and its appropriate hash and whatnot gets tacked onto a bulletin board where everybody can see it right the minute the election is over. That would prevent somebody from trying to run an election after, you know, just change the dates on all the machines. So we haven't got to software tampering yet. We're just talking about people trying to manipulate the machines as is. Everybody clear on this? Because we're, now we're going to start cranking up the evil the power of the evil people, yeah? Can you also get like preventative post-election 
problem? Okay, how did I prevent post facto fraud? So the threat model here is that our, poll, our erstwhile poll workers are not prepared to hack the software. They're simply prepared to set up the machines and start casting fake votes again. You know, hit the clear button on everything and then do a whole day worth of fake votes. Well, it'll take them, by definition, a day to finish. And if the poll's closed message has to be delivered, you know, two minutes after the official close of the official polls. What is the poll's closed message? Oh, it's just a message that, you know, all the machines echo around and broadcast to each other. I'm done, I'm done too, I'm done too. And so all the machines agree that they're done, and all those done, all those we're done messages can then be announced. Which would, and if that's been posted to a bulletin board, like literally printed out and tacked up to the wall, that, that, that casts that in stone. As a, and then it's harder for somebody to come along and generate something later, which will yield that same set of we're done messages at the end of the day. Okay? Okay, now we're gonna crank up the, the power of the attacker. Here's where it gets fun. So what if the attacker is prepared to try to clone these machines and run a concurrent shadow election? So they're gonna get the launch code at the beginning of the day and they're gonna sneak in at the end of the day and do a presto changeo. How do we prevent that attack? Right? Well, at this point, now we need to try to prevent the attacker from getting a hold of the crypto key material. How do you do that? Well, this is where we have to rely on TPM, you know, trusted computing chips. My stupid little Lenovo laptop has one of these Altel chips in it. And it's not good for much, but it, if you believe the marketing, it can hang on to a crypto secret. Anybody here have any experience with that? You worked on this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So do you believe that it has any value? I have not looked at the chips. So this is only like your PhD thesis work, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I told you I can heckle back, right? Anyway, so I'm not, I'm not claiming this is going to solve the problem, but at least we can try to increase the level of difficulty for somebody to get at the key material by hiding it inside a ceramic chip, you know, soldered to a motherboard. Not perfect, but a good start. Okay, anybody here from India? One, two, two? Okay, two and a half? Okay, so in India, there's a problem known as booth capture. So I'm not making this up. The way booth capture works is armed evil doers will show up at a polling place and like take over the polling place and cast votes as fast as they can until the police show up and scare them away. This seems like a bad plot from a 1920s, you know, like Groucho Marx kind of film, but this really happens in India. Like the current Indian electronic voting machines have a rate limiter built in to limit how fast you can cast votes as a countermeasure to this very attack. I find this staggering, but you know, democracy is wild and crazy, what can I say? Um, needless to say, detecting this is not difficult. <laughs> so what can we do as a countermeasure to this attack? Well, to some extent, you can imagine adding a, an alarm button to the administrator console, kind of like you know, bank tellers have the secret button under the counter. So you can hit the, you know, the alarm button on the console, and that would mean that at least any sub... You, you can then have uh, an epoch, and you know what happened before the epoch and after the epoch, and then you could at least separate out what are probably legitimate votes from what are probably illegitimate votes. That's a start. I'm not saying I've solved the problem, but at least now I can detect one from the other. Now, if our armed assailants are capable of, you know, uh, bringing along, I don't know, a, a degausser or something. They can certainly destroy former results if you want. I mean, I, ca I can't prevent our armed assailants from physically destroying voting machines. But if, if any one of the hard drives survives, I might still have all the records. Yeah? Hang out on punch cards after each vote. I'm sorry, what about punch cards? What? <coughs> after each vote is cast, you just have a punch card. Okay, so the, the question is, what about after each vote is cast, why not print it out on a punch card or some other paper mechanism? So if our threat model is armed assailants taking over the polling place, 
our armed assailants can, can attack paper probably easier than computers because they probably understand paper better. So that, I mean, paper is an important ingredient in an election, but I don't think it helps against booth capture. All right, so pushing onward. We're software people. How many people believe that the software that the vendor shipped is the software that's in the machine on election day? Why? You're, I gave you a PhD. You should know better. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should know better. Why did I give him a PhD? OK, so the scenario is that there might be malicious software installed in some or all of the machines. And in fact, we've added a new risk that one, because we've networked them together, one machine might be able to attack another one over our local network. So that's a, we've added a new risk. These could be introduced by poll workers. This could be introduced by field upgrades. You know, somebody claims to be, you know, have a shiny badge and say, oh, I'm here from Diebold. I'm here to, I'm here to help, right? And maybe they're not. Or even perhaps a voter can get to the magic port on the machine somewhere and dork with the machine somehow. So this is a very real threat because everything else I've described is worthless if a voter can tamper with the machine. Because then I press the button for Alice and at the summary screen, it says, you voted for Alice. And oh, by the way, there are some human factors results that say, even if it said Bob, 2 thirds of the people wouldn't notice. So even if you print it out on paper, 2 thirds of the people won't notice if you print it wrong. So it's kind of important for the software to be correct. The human factors dimension of voting is just a whole other hour of mental anguish for, for you that I'm going to spare you. Anyway. Hey, man. OK, it's, maybe it's worse. Anyway, the two-thirds number is, is a ballpark, but it, it, it's, I, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to say that it's a reasonable number. Anyway, it's countermeasures to software tampering. There are really two broad ways, or actually three broad ways. We could try to attack it via paper records, because it's exceptionally difficult to unprint paper. We haven't invented the unprinter yet. Maybe somebody at MIT is working on it, this new e-ink. I guess that you can unprint that stuff. But you can't unprint normal paper. So that, that, that's a start. You could, again, go the TPM trusted computing route. That might help prevent, I mean, at the very least, it might prevent the, the crypto keys from being released to unofficial software. So that has some value, because then everybody else could detect that the results coming from a machine were bogus. What I'll be talking about later, though, is trying to throw some cryptography at the problem in a way that we can do real-time audits of the machines. That's, that could be an entire hour-long talk by itself. I'm going to give you just the high points. But we can throw some crypto at this problem and actually come up with a clever solution. So I'm not actually ending my talk early. I'm just wrapping up this phase of it. In real elections, mistakes happen. Okay? Mistakes are just a part of the game. You know, Data is going to be lost. Auditing is both logically and physically challenging. And the question is, how can we throw technology at the problem? My proposal, my, my modest proposal to you, is that we should network the machines together locally, replicate everything everywhere, waste CPU like there's no tomorrow, because we, there's such a low event rate that we can afford it. And entanglement plus broadcast of everything helps us get recoverability. And there are a lot of other researchers doing a lot of other clever techniques in the electronic voting space, and a lot of that, and it all composes well with this system. A lot of other people are focused on tamper resistance. We're focused on recovery of data. And you can, these, these are you know, two great tastes that go great together. So please, don't fear the network. OK, coming up next, I'm going to compress an entire hour-long talk into about two minutes here and say, that there's a technique called homomorphic encryption, which broadly speaking has the property that you can take two ciphertexts, two encrypted things, and anybody can do an operation on them and yield the encryption of the two plain texts had they been added together. So you don't need to decrypt, add, and re-encrypt. You can do that all as one step, and anybody can do that step. So they can yield the encryption of the addition of the two things now, how can we leverage that? 
we have to use an alphabet soup of other cryptographic techniques. We have to have something called a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof, which is a fancy way of, that I can generate a statement that anybody in the world can verify that I have just encrypted either a zero or a one. And I'm not going to tell you which, but you know, I just gave Alice zero or one votes. And you can absolutely convince yourself that I've done that without me needing to reveal whether I gave Alice zero or one votes. And then I can prove that the sum of my votes for Alice, Bob, and Charlie is zero or one. And as long as I can prove all of those properties, you can convince yourself that, that the vote is not, I didn't just cast 50 votes for Alice. Again, you have no proof that the UI didn't cheat, but at least you have a proof that the vote is vaguely well formed. The only other crypto trick we need is that we can have the machine, we can do something called threshold cryptography, which means that it takes k out of n machines to agree on the result, the encrypted result, and if they all agree, they can jointly compute the decryption of it. So no one machine gets to decrypt like partial totals or partial sums or anything like that. Only all the machines or k out of n machines working together can arrive jointly at a result that they can all verify. So that means that an attacker would have to corrupt greater than k out of n machines in order to corrupt the election. So the crypto can buy us some really neat things. And here's where it gets fun. At that point, there's no danger to letting an election observer actually watch all the network messages go by. We'd rather the network observer not be able to inject messages. So we can do a simple trick called a data diode. Um, Doug Jones at the University of Iowa and one of his students built this thing. It fits into an Altoids tin. It just has a serial port on one side, a serial port on the other side, an IR, and a little bridge made out of an IR, you know, infrared LED and infrared LED detector. And you can look at this physical board and see there are no traces going from the left side to the right side. So you can convince yourself that this little stupid board that fits into an Altoids tin is a one-way data pipe. And on the other side of that data pipe, heck, why not put the whole, the whole internet? So now, all of the results from every polling place can be broadcast to the internet in real time. So now, heck, you can syndicate it with RSS, do whatever you want, and you can let anybody in real time audit the election as it's going on. That sounds kind of cool. So there are two other clever techniques we can bring into play here. One clever technique, which was invented by Josh Benelo, is a simple cryptographic trick that impacts the voting UI in one simple way. You have your regular voter experience. Who would you like to vote for president? Alice. Who would you like to vote for Senate? Bob, etc. And you get to the end, and the machine says, you, you say, I'm done. At that point, in the original Benelow version, the machine prints to a piece of paper behind a plate where you can't see it. It prints a cryptographic commitment, just a hash, of your vote. So the machine has been forced to commit to what your vote is. And the machine doesn't know that it's, about, that when it's about to give you a choice. Do you want to cast your vote, or do you want to challenge the machine? It's already committed. But if you hit cast, then it just throws your vote into the bucket like normal. If you hit challenge, then it's forced to reveal the plain text of your vote, which you can then compare to the hash commitment. If it matches, then you know the machine was behaving. If it doesn't match, you, you've caught the machine cheating, provably. So that same technique can be leveraged, excuse me, over the network. And now you can imagine a voter walking in with their iPhone or equivalent, and then we have to be a voter. They can say, I'm an election observer here from the country of Huzi Watsitstan to observe your election, and I want to challenge machine five now. And they can bring their video camera, point it at the screen, and, as, and you know, everybody can watch them like a hawk to make sure they don't accidentally press the cast vote button. And they can go through the whole dialogue, hit challenge. The machine didn't know it, but all the people did. And you can now catch the machine cheating by watching the results in real time over the internet. So this, and you can even imagine the League of Women Voters having a rack of servers where they can verify all this stuff in real time. League of Women Voters syndicating over RSS. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, right now we have, so the second cool thing that we can do is that we've built a whole uh, first order predicate general purpose validator. So we can write rules that says, for every cast vote message, there must exist a corresponding um, vote authorization message, and they'd better have the same nonce. 
or for every cast vote, there had better exist a polls open message, and it had better be the same polls open message. So we can write all these predicates, and we can evaluate them, and with a bunch of performance tuning that, people here, that some people here would find brilliant and some would find really boring, we've got that down to about four milliseconds per message, which, given that our message rate is messages per minute, so we're, we're several orders of magnitude ahead of the game. And that'll give us some room to spare, which will hopefully, I mean, our next research goal is to get the verification up to the point where, I mean, my goal is to have you know, anybody who wants with their home DSL line, with the CPU power of a home machine, be able to validate a million votes from an election in real time. That's the research goal, and I think we're gonna hit it. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here, take a couple questions, and then I'm gonna tell you about the California top to bottom review. So let's do a couple questions, and then I'll tell you how not to build a voting machine. So the question is, what if the vendor is evil? Is that, is, that, is that a paraphrase of the question? So this is where that whole, at some point, you have to have something you trust. So standard answer number one is paper. Have the machine print paper, which is then the machine committing to some ground truth, which, which can be independently audited. The problem with paper is voters don't check it. The other, so the, 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 the snazzy crypto answer is that you should be able to walk up to any machine at any time and challenge it in the way I've broadly described. And then you can catch a machine in the act of cheating. Now, let, let me flip this around. Let's say that 1% you know, of the machines are challenged. Well, and the machines don't know that they're being challenged versus not challenged. So as long as there are just enough challenges, the odds of a machine getting away with cheating start you know, shrinking dramatically. And if the League of Women Voters hires themselves, you know, somebody who's done basic uh, you know, probability and statistics, then they, you, know, you, can, you can drive that number as low as you want. Not perfect, but a good start. Does the challenge mechanism work if uh, the vendor is the one who's controlling the uh, cheating? So the challenge mechanism depends on somebody who is not evil being willing to do the challenging. So what that typically would mean in modern political practice is if the election administrator happens to be a Democrat, then the Republicans are going to be very interested in auditing the voting machines. And, and likewise, if the election administrator happens to be a Republican, then the Democrats are going to be very interested in auditing the voting machines. And this is one of the curious things where, you know, whoever's on the other side tends to be suspicious of whoever's in charge. So they'll do auditing. And you know, the League of Women Voters will find the local computer scientist and get them to go do some auditing. And you know, this, I think this could work. But auditing is clearly required. If you don't audit, you don't have any idea what's going on. So when you talk about uh, recovering from the election, is it, can you actually recover the results? Or is it more a question of detecting that something went wrong? Well, the answer is you know, how much damage was done. If somebody went and physically destroyed each machine and degaussed every hard drive, there's a limit to what I can do. I can probably detect it. <laughs> but I might not be able to recover the results. Right? And so what happens in any political universe if, if votes are lost? Well, you say, what is the total number of votes cast in precinct foo? Is it greater than the margin of victory? If so, oh boy. If not, whatever. And that's, that's, how, that's how it works in practice. In the event of the hijacked polling place, yeah. you, have the, you have the cutoff when, in the event law, when good events stop <coughs> and bad events started. Right. But in the actual image law, in the actual votes, can you tell the difference? So the votes are actually recorded in the order that they're cast, but encrypted. And 
So far, the crypto that I've described to you requires a coalition of the machines to get together in order to compute the sum and decrypt it and all that. You could also imagine encrypting the votes with the public key of the election administrator or something. So you could build a, you know, oh boy, backdoor into the system. And then you have to talk about, well, okay, we better do some threshold crypto and have some trustees who are in charge of the key material of the backdoor. That would be a whole separate engineering discussion. But to a cryptographer, that's all, yeah, sure, we can do that. It's not novel from a cryptographic perspective. It's just a matter of engineering the right properties. So uh, shall we push on and talk about the state of California's uh, top to bottom audit? OK, this will chew up just about the right amount of time. I'm now going to blast through a bunch of unrelated slides. That would be lots of fun if we had another hour, but we don't. And talk about the California top to bottom review of its electronic voting machines. This occurred this very summer. It was commissioned by your Secretary of State, um, Deborah Bowen. Very nice, very nice woman, very smart, actually. And what happened was Dave Wagner, UC Berkeley, gave me a call early, you know, like in May, and said, hey, Dan, I got, a, I got, I got, I got something for you. You want to do this? And I was like, really? <laughs> Sign me up. So we got SRI to give us some unused office space in a dark corner. We had some you know, old 1950s steel case desks, you know, state of the art technology. And this was the biggest study of its kind ever. You know, 40, 40 plus researchers, a bunch of grad students, a bunch of faculty type people like me. There were source code teams. I was on the source code team for one of the vendors. Red teams who had access to the physical machines could poke at them documentation people who read all of the voluminous filings that they're required to have, and even an accessibility team to make sure that the wheelchair actually fits under the place where it's supposed to fit. You know, you'd be amazed at how like, these, many of these machines weren't wide enough to get a wheelchair close enough to them. I mean, stupid stuff. Anyway, three vendors were considered. That's the URL. If you don't want to write it down, if you go to Google or your favorite search engine and type California top to bottom, you will find this. You might think that California top to bottom might find some other interesting search results. <laughs> but apparently voting, system is, voting systems are more popular. <coughs> Somebody here might need to work on that. OK, so we as a group found significant flaws with all three vendors. And for each vendor, we looked at all of their products, their optical scan, their, uh, their computerized things, every, the tabulation, the works. In particular, we found viral attacks. Let me, expl let, me, let, me, let me say that again. Voting machine virus. OK, let me say that one more time. You corrupt one voting machine once, and by the next election, they're all corrupt. Cool. Um, <laughs> As a result of all this, Diebold and Sequoia were, quote, decertified and conditionally recertified, which is a complicated legal way of saying that you can only have one per precinct and a huge number of restrictions on how they're used. So that way they can satisfy accessibility requirements, but most voters are in this state, you, are going to vote on paper, and that's a good thing. Hardener Civic, initially they got a slap on the wrist, and myself and the people on my team, Eric Reskrila, Hovav Shacham, and Sinu Ingova, said, uh, no. And I'm pleased to report that after months of, of going back and forth to Sacramento and all of that, we've, they have now issued a re, some revised conditions that recognize that things are pretty bad. And I'll talk about what this means in just a second. So. This is a Heart Inner Civic e -slate. This is what I vote on in Houston, Texas. It is not a touch screen. It has this like iPod wheel thing. And you dial down to who you want to vote for, then hit the Enter button. That's the basic UI. Pretty straightforward. And oh, by the way, they're networked together. This is the only major vendor voting machine. There's a polling place network. So do they use crypto? Yeah, kind of. They use HMAC SHA-1 to, to uh, as an integrity protection mechanism on the votes. Unfortunately, every voting machine in the entire county uses the same key. Anyone see a problem with this architecture? The key is not exactly a secret. 
And that kind of defeats the whole point of an HMAC. The keys are supposed to be secret. So it's actually really trivial to forge this or to get a hold of the key and then start forging or whatever. They actually, so Hardener Civic uses OpenSSL. They have this concept called, um, what do they call it? The idea is that you might collect results at these regional processing centers and then modem them home to Election Central. Not a bad idea, you know, if you're in a big county, like say West Texas, there's some very large counties and not needing to physically drive data to Election Central is a good thing. Well, they used OpenSSL, but if, if a machine sees a cert that it's never seen before, it just pops up a dialog box with all the X509 stats, you know, name, company, whatever, without anything to do with the key. Which means that you, know, you, can, for, you can do a self-signed cert and put anything you want into all of those proper name fields. So you can trivially forge a cert from anybody and get it accepted as long as a human being says, yeah, that looks OK, and hits the OK button. So they got OpenSSL wrong. There's no other crypto to speak of on the network. All the messages are plain text. Um, the network protocol, the most interesting feature from the oh my god perspective is they have messages that read and write memory inside the voting machines directly. Please give me byte ranges x to y, please. Thank you. So that means you can extract that HMAC key, you can extract the votes, you can, you know, do all kinds, and you can write to any address in memory, which means you can overwrite the code, you can overwrite the votes, you can overwrite anything you want in the memory of any machine. That's, that's also a tasty way of injecting viruses. And regular voters in the voting booth can reach behind the machine and unscrew the port and speak this protocol. It's not Ethernet, it's some bizarre EIA 485 thing. Mod, yeah, so th this, so this is something that shows up in the SCADA universe. It's, a, it's, it's you know, weird from our perspective, normal from embedded people's perspective. Yeah, you can buy you know, USB adapters for your computer. Anyway, so here's the viral attack. So there's this thing called Servo, which is used at the end of the day. It does inventory management. It lets you extract and data from the machines, clear the machines, et cetera. So each of the machines at the end of the day has a little, you plug it into Servo, it checks it in, yep, I got serial number foo, the next machine comes along, and eventually you hit a machine that was evil, because one voter corrupted one machine. Servo, as it turns out, is full of buffer overflow vulnerabilities. So now you take over Servo, which can promptly use that memory overwriting technique to blast the next machine that it talks to, ad infinitum. And now all the machines are evil in time for the next election. One voter can do a ridiculous amount of damage. So once a machine has been compromised, the only way you can fix it is, to, is with screwdriver. Open up the back, replace the chips inside the machine, that sort of a thing. I mean, the official software upgrading tool that Hart uses when they upgrade their own software uses these very same memory read and write commands. Needless to say, once you've taken over the machine, you can happily ignore all of that. So, oh, by the way, a couple other fun things. These machines support headphones, which is a good thing if you are blind or have low vision or have some dyslexic type condition. A lot of different people can benefit from having the machine talk while it works. And anybody who wants you, I went and voted once and I said, can I use the thing with the headphones? And they said, sure, no problem. And so I put on the little headphones and as you're clicking, whatever you highlight, it just reads. You know, President George Bush, President Al Gore, President, you know, whatever. It just, it just reads what's under the cursor, very straightforward. Well, turns out that you can receive this with a shortwave radio at a substantial distance. Which means that you can hear the machine chatting away I mean, the room that they were in, they could get about as far away as from here to the back of the room. That was the size of the room they were in. And anywhere they went in the room, their little shortwave radio, the accessibility team discovered this. This, this guy named Noel Runyon, he's awesome. Anyway, another interesting feature lets you adjust vote totals in the tabulation system. Now, if, if, if somebody came to you and said, I've got a feature requirement. We need a way to adjust vote totals. <laughs> How would you engineer the adjust vote totals solution in your voting machine? 
A, would you add an entry to the database that said adjustment for this entry is plus two, or B, would you overwrite the number that was already there in the database? Who votes for A? <laughs> Who votes for B? Well, guess what? They just overwrote the number in the database, which is staggering. I, mean, I, read the, I was reading the, the, the manual, and it said, here's this feature. And I'm like, er? So I went, I'm like, you know, looking for the SQL code in the source code, and sure enough, they just blasted right over. It's staggering. Uh, anyway, so needless to say, Diebold, which has now renamed itself to Premier, and Sequoia had problems of comparable magnitude to what I've described in Hard Inner Civic. Um, ESNS, which caused all the excitement in Sarasota last year, was not considered in this study because this particular machine isn't used in California. Um, What's coming next? Well, other states will hopefully follow California's lead and realize, oh my God, and do something about it. Um, like this notion of limiting the number of DREs used and shifting some or all voters over to paper. That's a good thing, I support that. And likewise, mandatory audits of a variety, you know, it, we could talk about auditing for the next hour. Vendors will hopefully engineer better products. You know, hopefully public, em if public embarrassment can't do it, I don't know what, what can. And needless to say, optical scan paper ballots are growing in popularity. So that's all I've got to talk about for today. Do I have time for any more questions? Uh, I think we've got time for, we'll call it three questions. All right, let's do it. Yes. So are any of the vendors looking at some of the work you're doing, or Rob Rubin, or all these folks, and responding? <sighs> Are any of the vendors responding? The vendors right now are in a defensive posture. I was invited to testify at a hearing in Tennessee where all the vendors got to speak first and then I got to go. And let's just say that they were in cover your posterior mode and they are not yet ready to hear about how they need to re-engineer their systems. Maybe they will, but they're not there yet. Meanwhile, we do have an election coming up soon, don't we? Yeah. Other questions? How common are these voting machines now across the country? In the 2006 election, approximately 41% of the votes were cast on some variant of electronic voting machine. 50% were cast on some kind of paper, and 9% other. The numbers in 2008 are probably going to be of com you know, comparable. Uh, of, of the electronic voting machines, how many are operated by this small cartel, and what hope is there that there will be uh, a more diverse uh, marketplace? So, the of all, you know, there are probably four vendors who have the lion's share of the marketplace, and. I'm not going to go so far as to call them a cartel. There's a favorite quote of mine from Bonaparte Napoleon, which is, never ascribe malice what can be adequately explained by incompetence. <laughs> that is very much the situation that the voting system vendors are in today. We don't need malice to explain where they are. What can we do to address the problem? You know, of course, right now, the same vendors who are selling the optical scan systems are the ones who previously sold the electronic voting machines. The problem is that people who are really smart computer scientists, for some reason, want to work at companies that give them free food and, you know, <laughs> free t-shirts and stuff. And that, for some reason, these kinds of people don't want to go work for small vendors with no budget and they're controlled by marketing people rather than engineers. I mean, let me describe a market to you, and you tell me whether you want to do a startup in this market. You have 50 states with different regulations for your product, sometimes kind of contradictory. Like Texas says you must have a, summer, you must have a straight ticket voting option. California says you may not have a straight ticket voting option. So that means you have to do 50 separate QA processes for 50 separate state builds of your software. Or maybe you're smart enough to do it in a config file, but whatever. You have to deal with 
50 separate state regulatory processes, and ultimately you're selling to county clerks who don't understand the technology you're selling at all and are more likely to be influenced by their buddy who they used to work with who now represents a vendor. So is that a market you want to jump into to sell a product? Does that sound like a great startup opportunity? No. <laughs> so unfortunately, you know, the, the, the brilliant people of Silicon Valley who want to make lots of money are rationally not getting involved in the voting machine market. So my hope for the future of the universe is that you know, academics like myself can, build, can get our research prototypes up to the point where we're confident that they work reasonably well and then you know, GPL them or something and really reduce the barrier to a vendor. The market that, that I would like to see evolve if I was king for a day, which in a democracy is moderately ironic, I would like to see a market where there's some central organization that is a nonprofit who's in charge of the software and then have a standard spec for the hardware that multiple vendors can compete to sell into. And you know, so commoditize the hardware, have the software be written by some government pseudo bureaucracy and let, you know, if there's only one hunk of software, there can be a lot more attention to auditing it and getting it right. Now, that's the way I would like to see things happen. Is that going to happen anytime soon? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't bet on it. Well, on that note, I think we're going to have to finish up. So let's thank the speaker. Thank you.